Hey everyone, welcome back to another video in the USMLE series. Today we have with us somebody who's extremely special who's managed to match into dermatology and is currently a dermatology attending doctor in New York with us. And his name is Dr. Osama Sayed. Sir, you can take on the stage, just give us an introduction of yourself. And I would love to know about your whole journey and how you were able to match into one of the most competitive specialties ever. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on the channel, Manik. And I was a little bit confused when you said there's someone really special. I thought we were expecting a third guest, but I, I guess that's me for the sake <laughs> of this talk. So thank you yeah. for that generous introduction. Yeah. A little bit about me. Yeah. So my name is Osama Sayed. I, I did my medical school and, and spent most of my life living in England. I went to Imperial College in London, graduated in 2016. And I'd say from around my third year of medical school onwards, I was pretty convinced that I wanted to move to America for various reasons that, you know, we can get into. But I had that idea fixated in my head from then, did my USMLEs in my fifth year, got everything prepared to do my away rotations and things in my final year. And then I went on to, to leave right after medical school, actually. So I didn't do any year of training in England. I just left straight away, came across to America and applied for training. And uh, thankfully, first time around, managed to match into dermatology. And so it's been happily ever after ever since. And so... Because I'm an old person, I've now finished all of my years of training. I got board certified last July, and I've been working now as an attending for a year and a half here in Manhattan. So, yeah. Tell me about like your match reaction. I, I, I'm just intrigued because whenever you think about going into competitive specialities like plastic surgery, dermatology, or any uh, like neurosurgery, right? Like, mm -hmm. and the average IMG is kind of very scared to get like their like you know hands dirty with the rotations of these specialties because. They're too afraid that they like won't match because yeah. there is this bias towards IMGs like in this competitive specialities and mm -hmm. you need high scores, research experience and all not. Like what was your thought process when like you went towards the match into dermatology? Like weren't you scared sure. that you weren't going to match and what's going to happen then? Yeah, so, so I guess it helps to provide a bit more context. So for me, I, I wasn't one of those people who knew they wanted to match into dermatology from the beginning. A lot of American grads have a very clear sense from their first year of medical school exactly what specialty they want to do. And so they'll optimize their application, their away rotations, their publications, all for one specialty. That's not what it's like in England. In England, you really don't know what specialty you're going to go into until multiple years after medical school finishes because the system there keeps you generalized for so long that none of your colleagues really have a clear sense. And so you don't have a clear sense. So I actually didn't even know what specialty I wanted to do when I was going on my away rotations. I had scheduled two rotations into orthopedic surgery. So again, not an easy specialty, but the one that I thought I, I might like. And so I decided to, to do away rotations in that. But when I came out here to the US within the first three days, after a few 4.30 a.m. ward rounds and 11 p.m. finishes to the day, I realized that that wasn't the specialty <laughs> for me. And so uh, I was sitting there in the library of Cornell here in, in New York, trying to figure out what specialty I actually might like. And so I went through every single specialty. And then I got to dermatology and I thought, you know what, like great mix of surgeries that are not seven hours long, but that are short and medicine and you get long term connections with your patients and it's very satisfying and it pays well. And a big priority for me was having a good work-life balance later in life. And so it ticked all of those boxes. And the only thing that was left that was holding me back was... Um, when I typed it into Google, like IMG match into dermatology, as you can imagine what those forums look like right now, they basically all told me to go die and give up on life and it would never work and all of those same things. But the way I see it, I'm like, that, that is a terrible reason not to try to do something that otherwise fits with your life plans. The idea that it's hard or some disembodied voice on the internet tells you it's impossible. So I decided, listen, if it's if it's important to me, I should at least give it a try. And so that's the kind of the mentality I'd encourage IMGs to have is that if there's a specialty that you're incredibly passionate about, even if it's really, really like complicated and it won't be a straightforward application process, if it means a lot to you, you owe it to yourself to give it a try. Now, that doesn't mean that most IMGs are going to match dermatology. Like you'd have to face the reality. It, it, the numbers speak for themselves and they are not positive. But you should have a plan A, which is here is how I'm going to match into my dream specialty. Here is how many years I will potentially try that process. But here is my cutoff. If, for example, after this many years and this many tries, it doesn't work for me, would I be willing to compromise? Would I be willing to try again for a different specialty that's more IMG friendly? Or what is my best alternative? And so in my case, my best alternative was I had a pretty good career pathway in the UK set for me. I also even thought about leaving medicine, to be honest. So I thought about how if things don't work out for me, I'll completely leave medicine and go into something else like tech or private equity or things like that. So I think all of those things together for me made it make sense to give it my best try to apply for a specialty that fit my life kind of targets 
And if it didn't work, I had other plans that I could turn to. So that being said, like, what, what, what the like other backup plans? Didn't you have any backup plan of going into internal medicine? I know that you mm. wanted to quit medicine and all, but did you have yeah. like backup special specialities? Did you apply to backup specialities when you applied mm-hmm. to dermatology? Yeah, so I actually didn't. So so I only applied, obviously with dermatology, the way it works is you have to apply to prelim programs mm-hmm. and then also the advanced dermatology program. But I applied to no other advanced program. So I applied to no other for, or, or, or categorical. I didn't apply to internal medicine. I didn't apply to anything to begin with because the way I saw it I'm like this is my first try so on my first try I should be very picky I should I should go for only what I would want to actually match into and to that end it sounds very arrogant but that wasn't the way I was approaching it I actually only applied to around 20 dermatology programs I didn't even apply to all the derm programs in the country I just applied to the ones that I would be excited to go to and so I was very very selective but that's only because my backup was I had a fantastic job lined up in England so I I, I secured a an academic foundation program, AFP, which was like seen as quite prestigious in England. And I knew that if I had to go back and 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 join the career pathway there, I had a lot of options available to me. So to that end, I didn't apply for any backups in my first cycle. If I had not matched, would I have potentially been open to, you know, something else like internal medicine and then rheumatology or, or something to that end? Maybe. And, and I had considered that, but thankfully it, it didn't come to it. Wow. So where did you exactly match? So I match into Mount Sinai. So so Mount Sinai here in, in, in Manhattan, which is, is a fantastic dermatology program. So I think some years it's number one, some years it's number two in the country. So it was a fantastic program for, for me to match into. And I actually had a connection with the program. So that's kind of important for us to talk about in that once I had decided in that <laughs> library at Cornell that I was applying for dermatology, the first thing I did was I emailed like 15 different program directors in dermatology here in New York saying, hey, I'm here in New York right now. I didn't mention that I was on an orthopedic surgery elective because I didn't think that would have been a good sell. But I said, I'm in New York right now. Like I'm an IMG. Is there any way you could give me just five minutes for us to have like a conversation for me to get some advice? I'll bring you your favorite coffee to save you those five minutes so that it's like net neutral for you. Like I sent this email to to 15, 20 people and I actually got like maybe three to four replies, including the program director of Mount Sinai at the time. And so I went and and met him for five minutes. He was like two hours late, but I was like, I don't care. I'm going to sit here in this waiting room for as long as I need to, to get some FaceTime. And then I met the Mount Sinai program director of dermatology. Now that conversation was basically, he, he was, he started off saying, Hey, here's why IMGs can't match into dermatology. And so he went off on this long talk about book knowledge and communication skills and all this kind of stuff. And the only thing that changed at all was he basically said, Oh, by the way, have you, have you done your step one exam? And I was like, Oh yeah, I've, I've actually done it. And uh, I got a two, six, two at the time when there was still a step one score. And so the second I said that he said, go to two, six, two. And I was like, Oh yeah. And he goes, that's insane. And then suddenly his entire demeanor, his entire approach, everything changed. And at that point he said, what are you doing next year? And I was like, oh, I have this job lined up in London that I'm starting for a year. And he was just like, forget that job. Come work with me while you apply. And if you get, if you manage to impress me, it'll help your application. And so that is what changed all of this. And that is how I got my kind of relationship with Mount Sinai. A cold email followed by a 20 minute talk followed by my life changing. So basically... These are the kind of things where when you read these forums and you read these percentages and all this kind of stuff, you have to remember that in the US, it is one person, a program director, who decides who to take into their program. If you happen to get on the good side of this person and prove yourself to them over a span of multiple years, that's all you need. You only need one person. And that's what I encourage everyone to keep in mind, no matter what they're applying for, is that there is no rule book. These are human relationships. And so where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Like, and I think even based on statistics, like which the NRMP takes out, mm-hmm. I think it doesn't capture so many other things like connections and like Correct. your ability to build rapport with people. And yeah. then like later use those connections to get into programs. So I think like, like that, those Reddit forms that we see, that's more like the middle part Correct. of the bell curve, but like the way you play it can actually change everything. Like, like just like you said. So Correct. basically when you applied, like how many interviews did you get out of those 20 programs that you applied yeah. to? So I applied to 20. I got, I think, five interviews actually, for, which was great, including at Harvard and at the Cleveland Clinic. And so th- those were the other kind of major institutions I had interviews at. But as the year went on, because I was part of the Sinai Derm Department in this postdoctoral research fellowship role that they'd created for me, basically, I knew after within a couple of months of that, I know they always say don't take people's assurances like seriously, but I was working so closely with the program director and the chairman and the rest of the department 
that I had a strong sense that I was going to match at Mount Sinai. So that's why when you were saying, you know, things like match reaction, obviously I was very, very happy, but it wasn't a huge surprise and elation for me because there's little indications. Like when you're working well, sometimes they'll say like, oh, and when you're here with us, in future or you know you'll see this when you're a resident or people will make comments that kind of give you an indication that they're already seeing you in that way and so i had a lot of like positive feedback which which again as i've heard go the other way as well so i wouldn't put too much basis on that a lot of people get false assurances and then they get burnt but i had a great relationship with the department and so i was confident i was going to match there so much so that i actually didn't go to my cleveland clinic dermatology interview which which again is is sounds a little bit insane and arrogant but <laughs> yeah. it was it was it was it was because I had such a strong sense that I was going to be at Mount Sinai and I wanted to be in New York and Cleveland. No offense to anyone who lives in Cleveland, but I had been there and it is a boring place <laughs> to, to, to spend time. And so I just thought, you know what, like I'm, I'm going to just not go because imagine flying all the way, spending all that money, because by that point, you're broke when you're like a student on the interview trail. Back then, it wasn't a video interviews, right? It was in-person interviews. And I had to go to both prelim and Derm interview. So it was getting to the point where I was like, oh, like this is going to cost me like a thousand dollars to fly to Cleveland hotels, flight back. So I just didn't even go. And they emailed me back being like, are you okay? <laughs> that like you're, you're an IMG and you're not coming to, to the dermatology interview. And I was just like, oh yeah, sorry. Have like a, like a family. I had to say a family thing because I didn't want to seem like I was insulting them. But yeah, by that point, I had such a strong sense that I was going to be at Mount Sinai that, that thankfully it worked out for me. But I don't know if anybody should follow my footsteps in what I did there because it was probably a stupid thing to do if they had ended up burning me. Like I have other questions that stem out mm -hmm. from the story. The first sure. question is like you got interviews from Harvard, like like the likes of Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. Like did your program director or the chairman there vouch for you to get those interviews or was it just based on the strength of your CV? Yeah, no, so they didn't vouch for me. It was it was basically the strength of the CV in that like I had solid scores and publication wise, I didn't have a ton of publications. I had like eight to 12, which I know sounds like a lot for some people, but in the derm world, it's really not that much. And they weren't dermatology specific publications even. They, they were quite limited in that sense. The thing that I did have was I had strong letters of recommendation. So I had letters of recommendation from the Mount Sinai program director. He didn't kind of personally call people, but he was on my application. And then I also had a letter of recommendation from someone who was the past president of the American Academy of Dermatology, who was based at Cleveland Clinic, where I had also rotate, rotated, right? So that helped with them. Harvard, I had no connection with at all and no one vouched for me, but I think they just saw the strength of my application, saw names they recognized, like writing letters for this random IMG who had good scores and thought, oh, it's worth us kind of taking a risk on him. But yeah, otherwise I had no kind of personal outreach. In fact, it was, it probably counted a little bit against me in that like, Mount Sinai and some programs tend to guard their people quite jealously in the sense that if you're one of their fellows and they want to take you, if another department were to call them and say, oh, what do you think of this guy we're thinking of interviewing? They'll be like, <laughs> oh, he's coming to us. Like they, they'll say that very, <laughs> very kind of uh, forthrightly that he will be matching with us. And that, mm -hmm. that kind of is like a hands off warning to some of the programs. So, but I didn't mind because it's where I wanted to go anyway. So uh, basically what like got you in into a dermatology residency was solid scores plus like strong letter of recommendations plus that research experience as well right and Correct. let's say if if i were an img and i want to go into plastic surgery neurosurgery yeah. what kind of a pathway would you tell me to go to provided step one is pass fail and we just have a step to seek a score like yeah. where should i start right now yeah, so this is something which, which again, well, I, I do mentorship, you know, separately th th through uh, the Liberty Medics company I, I told you about. And uh, any of my mentees who want to do a competitive specialty, I'm clear cut with them that your only reliable pathway to that, reliable still not being guaranteed, is to do a research fellowship. You, you should see that as an absolute must. And the reason for that is even American graduates from Ivy League institutions who want to match into dermatology often do one to two years of unpaid fellowships. Th that's kind of how competitive these things are. So I think a lot of IMGs sometimes misunderstand that and they think like, oh, I'm being abused and I'm being kind of taken advantage of by these programs. Like, I don't want to be part of this fellowship route. I'm just going to get in by the strength of my application. And may maybe, maybe if you're one of the absolute edge cases, like the 0.001%, for everyone else, you are going to need to do a research fellowship because even the Americans you're competing with are doing unpaid research fellowships. So the fact that you think you're going to somehow be that good, that they're going to want to choose you with all of your visa complications and potential cultural adaptation problems without a fellowship, I, I don't know how good you'd have to be. And so from my experience, the only IMGs that I see match into these ultra competitive places are ones who have long-term relationships with departments who have fellowships and have really impressed with their output, reliability, 
rapport they've been able to build it with the department. And then through that sheer force of will, you end up matching. So the pathway is there. You just have to know it is through a research fellowship. It is through a research fellowship. And yeah. what according to you, like, is there in a research fellowship, like that kind of makes a program interested in you? Like, how can you win them over if I were to start a research fellowship? Like, like, cause it's a very different thing being a research fellow and being Correct. a resident and because res residency is extremely clinical and Correct. like a research fellowship is just publishing papers and yeah. like, how do the like two intersect? Is it that you're networking throughout the research fellowship that's mm -hmm. causing it or is it something yeah. else? It is purely interpersonal skills, <laughs> purely, purely interpersonal skills. I think this is the part which a lot of people miss even when it comes to away rotations. A lot of IMGs I see are like, oh, I'm studying for my away rotation. I'm making sure I have all the right clinical knowledge. I'm going to blow them off their feet. And that's great. If they ask you a question or if you're able to present well because you have clinical knowledge, wonderful. But that's really not going to be what determines whether or not you match. The only thing that matters is do the other residents like you? Do the attendings like you? <laughs> like the associate program directors, the program directors, do they like you as a person? And with that in mind, you deciding to go grab the residents lunches for them when it's a busy day will probably do more good for you than you being really smart when it comes to DKA management. And that's, I think, what a lot of IMGs miss is that the only thing that matters is that when you're done with the rotation and you ask for letters of recommendation or you ask for people to vouch for you, they say, oh, you know what? He's a great guy. Like, I really enjoyed having him around. Good team player. I would love to work with him in the future as like a colleague. That is by far and away the most important thing. And so when you're doing a research fellowship, the advantage you have is you're just there. <laughs> like you literally have more face-to-face -face across the span of one to two years where different faculty members see you. You should go out of your way to attend the didactic teaching, the clinical teaching with the other residents. You'll naturally get to know them if they're friendly people. They'll ask about you. You might socialize with them and hang out with them outside of work. With the attendings, yeah, they'll face to face, they will just get familiar with you. And also then you should, should of course, impress them with your research output, be reliable, make sure you're producing high quality work on time. But it's all of those other things. It's it's that you've just become part of the team, right? Like, oh, oh, I know him. Oh, he's been, Osama's been with us for two years, like a great guy. He is not a general IMG. He's Osama, the guy that we know, right? And so what I always tell IMGs is like the biggest thing you need to do is Get yourself in becoming a real person in their eyes and not an IMG on paper. Because an IMG on paper is really easy to dismiss and reject. Whereas the person that they have got to know and have an attachment with, that means they're going to give you an interview and they're going to look upon you more favorably. I think like that's what discounts a lot of IMGs is the interpersonal communication skills, especially yeah. like in psychiatry where like I apply that, where like scores mm -hmm. really don't matter and all people care about is like how well can you like communicate with patience because that's what matters yeah. in the end right like you might that's have the right. highest scores on papers right and you have like a tremendous amount of research but if you can't put all of that into your work by communicating with the patient then what good is it right absolutely yeah and I, 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 could, I couldn't so like that being said like there is this other consensus that publications matter a lot even mm -hmm. the ones that were done out of the program let's say within your own country like, yeah. what's your view on that? Like, because people keep yeah. on trying to publish their own papers and don't like try to do the research experience or the research fellowship. So yeah. what's your view on that? Yeah, so I think publications are great in the sense that if you're applying to certain specialties, they're seen as almost a requirement. So for example, the orthopedic surgeries, the plastic surgeries, the dermatologies, that's just become part of the, the, the screening process because they have so many high quality candidates. And now that the step one score is gone, it's like, what are you going to look at, right? The next thing you're going to look at is, oh, as a program, it would be nice if we had someone who could bring prestige to our program with their research output. So they'll take a look at that. Now, when it comes to publications, um, there's two ways of approaching it. One is like you are truly a rock star researcher in that you've done a PhD somewhere, you've produced really formative work and, and you know, presented it in big journals. Great. That is a huge value add. Other than that, if you've done like, you know, five to 10 small publications or case reports or done it in little journals that no one's heard of, it might tick the box in their head like, oh, this is a person who is research oriented or research curious. That's still a positive. It's it's not nothing. And it's definitely more worthwhile for you compared to I was the president of the med society of my university. No one knows what that means, right? So because there is no standardization of any of those things, I wouldn't bother wasting your time care, caring, like, sorry, caring about your roles in these university societies. With, with that mindset, publications are still more valuable to you because they're, they're if they're in a PubMed index journal, 
that means something to them compared to these other achievements. So I think, yeah, they definitely play, play a role. And I've, I've been part of admissions panels. I've been part of interview panels where people comment on the fact that, oh, the other good thing about this applicant is that they are research oriented and that'll be good for us. So it definitely plays a role. Yeah, but not as big as the research fellowship itself, where it's like you not on paper, but rather with them. Correct, one hundred percent. And I mean, obviously, the 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 ideal world is you would have a research experience of multiple months with every department you're applying to, but you just can't do that, right? So I think like that's why it's tough. I think the research experience for the one program you're at is a massive value add. Also, because yeah, you become a real person, but those people are going to give you great letters of recommendation, and it acts as almost like a quality assurance seal for other programs. So another program that sees like, oh, by the way, this guy has been a postdoc research fellow at Mount Sinai. Oh, well, you know, that takes away a lot of our, our concerns about him. He's already adjusted for the U.S. healthcare system. A big other institution has decided he's good enough to do a research fellowship with them. So I think, and then you get those letters of recommendation from them as well. So I think research experiences at big institutions are far more valuable, but publications themselves have a role to play. What about electives versus a research fellowship? If you were given a choice, let's say, yeah. like to do electives, let's say six months in a row in dermatology, mm-hmm. right, yeah. versus the research fellowship, what do you think would like be your priority? Yeah, I think the tough thing is with the research fellowship, then you're putting all your eggs in one basket, right? So it could go very, very well for you. If you have a great rapport, if you impress people, you your chances of matching in that one program have increased massively, but it's all your eggs in one basket. And so if people decide, I want to do six away rotations at different programs, I understand that sentiment because then you have a chance to appeal to multiple different other people. I think it's also very specialty dependent. So in dermatology, no matter how good you are in a one month away rotation as an IMG, that's not going to be enough to get you to match in that program. It's just not. And so in internal medicine, in IMG friendly programs like that or neurology, it's a better idea to hedge your bets and do one month in multiple different institutions because you'll guarantee more interviews, increase your chance of matching. But in something like derm, orthoplastics, you really have to pick your best shot and give it your all and then see what happens. In that sort of institution, basically. Correct. Yeah. Pick okay. one institution. Yeah. That makes sense. That that brings on to my like last question to you. Mm-hmm. And that is, suppose I'm an IMG, right? And mm-hmm. I have a below average chapter CK score. Yes. Should I think about applying to competitive specialities provided I have a mm-hmm. below average score? And most people in these specialities, like who are applying, most of the applicants don't have a below average score. They, they, they're like in the 270s, 260s. What, what yeah. is your thought process on that? My thought process is I have seen it work even with low scores and that, that might shock people. I have seen it work with low scores because what it comes down to is just personal connections, right? So like if you are willing to put in the hard yards and maybe multiple years of unpaid research fellowships and uncertainty and applying and failing and applying again, I wouldn't let the step two CK score make you think it's impossible because I've seen people with low scores still do it as IMGs. Just know that with everything that's counting against you, you're making your slope steeper and you're reducing your chances. But I'll never tell anyone that it's a 0% chance and so what i'll say is listen you're going to make your life much harder if you're an img and you've decided you must match into dermatology or plastics but that's life if you decide that's your future and it's your 50-year career and you don't mind risking it for three years and potentially ending up with nothing to show for it on the other end take that risk but if you're in the financial position where you're like listen if i don't match the first two years i can't apply again and i have to go back home and i'll give up on the american dream then at that point i'll say play the percentages game in the same way you play the percentages game in all aspects of life if it's just a one swing and that's the only chance I have to get to America, then ask yourself, could I be happy in another specialty? Could I be happy being a internal medicine or primary care doctor with an interest in aesthetics, for example, if you want to do, you know, injectables or things like that? If you can persuade yourself that that's a route you'd be happy with, do that instead because you'll make your life much easier if you have a low score. But it is still possible if, if, it's, if it's your main hope and you're and you're able to to... also like there is this other pathway people go by like a lot of doctors go by is that they will do like one speciality like internal medicine and then Mm -hmm. they'll apply to dermatology or orthopedics again yeah where do you see that going like considering that they're they're board certified in one speciality how does that work sure we we have one minute we have one minute 
Okay. Um, so, so I would say that's a very bad idea. Don't do that because every year that you do training in another program, you actually lose a year of your funding that comes from the GME, the Graduate Medical Education Office. So the government pays for most people's years of training. And if you've used up two or three years in another specialty, and then you try and apply for dermatology, they'll say not only are you an IMG and you visa problems, all this other stuff. Now we don't even have funding for you. We have to pay for you. Whereas an American grad would be free for us. So you've made your life much harder. So it is not an easy route. If you decide to do another specialty, you're better off not starting another specialty and reapplying if that's what you really want to do. I had no idea that was the case. That's... It's a big thing and I've seen it burn tons of people. So please don't make that mistake, guys. Wow. Thank you so much, by the way. My pleasure. Like, Where can the applicants watching right now find you if they were to communicate with you? Sure. So people can find me on Instagram or YouTube at Osama Sayed. Although, again, I, I will just warn that I'm, I'm very bad at replying to messages on there because I do get a ton of messages. So just keep that in mind. And otherwise, as I mentioned, we have that, that company called Liberty Medics, which is just entirely built for helping IMGs move their career to the U.S., so we can put the link for that below if people want to check it out. We have some free articles, free sample videos and things like that on there too. So check that out. And yeah, that's probably the best place we put to go. All right, guys, take care. If you have any questions, please comment and we can get back to you whenever we have free time. And thanks for watching. Bye, guys.